they have moved a bit nearer the front. It feels a little bit more cosy. Um, I'm really welcome. I'm really delighted to welcome you to our first panel session of the day on why do we need greater transport investment in the north? I'm suspecting this could be a fairly lively debate. I'm Katie Day. I'm TFN's Director of Policy, Communications and Strategy. And that includes our technical analysis and modelling team too. Um, I joined TFN last month and so it's actually really terrific to be here at the conference today and get the chance to meet so many of our partners and people we work with regularly, our stakeholders face to face and to hear your views and listen. As you can probably hear from my accent, I'm an adopted northerner. Um, I've worked here in Newcastle, in Leeds, in Carlisle, in Liverpool, in Manchester. Um, this region is amazing. It's my home. It's where I go on holiday. Um, and I just think it's got a huge amount to offer. Now, before I invite our panel to just give a few introductory remarks and let you know who they are, um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, matters. We've got until about half past 12 um, when we'll break for lunch um, and the lunch is back out in the main area and also in the Hawthorne restaurant and in the gym bar. But I'll give you those instructions again at the end so you know where you're going. Um, I'm also a very firm believer in diversity um, and I'm absolutely delighted that we've got an all-female panel here today, just a couple of days away from International Women's Day. Because I think if you've got diversity of people, of knowledge, of experience, of geography, of background, whatever it may be, it can actually help us get greater perspective on the world and the reality that we live in. And when you can see more, and hear more and understand more about the context that we're working in and what it means for different people. I'm confident that means we can make better informed decisions, whether that's about the transport investment we need now or from the world I came from, which was nuclear, which was how we keep people safe. So why do we need more transport investment in the North? Um, well, I've no doubt from what you've heard already in this morning's plenary and from your own experiences and that of the communities and businesses you work with, you've got a pretty good idea. But I want you to just hold that thought for a little bit longer. Why am I here making the case for investment? Well, because effective and efficient transport is a catalyst for change. And it's not just the economic prize, it's social inclusion and it's decarbonisation. As a child, my family depended on our local buses to access the services that we needed. We didn't have a car. And I still remember the numbers on the buses, the 218 and the 219, and the various routes they went on. But if we didn't have those services, we couldn't have got to the doctors, to the opticians, to leisure facilities, to go and see our family. Transport really opened up opportunities. Talking of opening up, let me invite our panel to introduce themselves and say a little bit about why we need more transport investment here in the north. Mayor Braven. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much. And it is absolutely a delight to be here. I was only 45 minutes late, so I'm sure you've all got your war stories of how you got here on the trains today. But it's an absolute pleasure. And to see an all-women panel in transport is great. And congratulations to everybody that organised this. And pleased to be here because the case for greater investment is clear. TFN's evidence shows the enormous economic and social potential, and we look forward to the launch of TFN's strategic plan later this month. But to get the most out of investment, we absolutely have to look at our economy in the round, to look at skills, housing, culture, and the benefit of devolution and MCAs is joining up all of this together to do things locally, to connect people wherever they live to opportunity. All of these things are interconnected. For example, we need to significantly grow the role of the railway to have any chance of hitting our climate emergency targets. TFN's strategy is to achieve net zero from service, surface transport by 2045. In West Yorkshire, our ambition is to achieve net zero economy by 2038. That is why we absolutely absolutely need investment like Northern Powerhouse Rail and HS2 to free up the extra capacity we need to make the most of local rail services and to get more freight off the roads and onto trains. On the face of it, the integrated rail plan makes a welcome commitment of £96 billion for the rail network. But when you look at the small print, you'll see that half of that is being spent on HS2 between London and Crewe. The eastern leg to Leeds scrapped. We need a proper strategic investment plan for the whole country. 
Yet after 50 months after the IRP, we're still waiting for the terms of reference for the promised studies, how to get HS2 services to Leeds, Leeds station capacity, and Bradford to Leeds electrification, not to mention how we can improve connections between Leeds and Sheffield. We need a proper plan to give certainty and to allow us to make smart investment choices. This current hiatus undermines investment potential in our towns and cities. Development in Leeds is on hold until decisions on HS2 are made. We need to absolutely unlock Bradford's potential, the worst connected city by rail in England, by improving transport links for its young and diverse population. And let's not forget UK City of Culture in 2025. We have got to be able to capitalise on that. Bradford's Southern Gateway proposals would bring 27,000 new jobs and an extra £30 billion worth of GVA to our region. Birmingham has shown what certainty can bring. 70% of businesses in the city expect to benefit as a result of HS2. So even if we get clarity on certain projects, it's not clear where the overarching plan will come from, from the improvements and the investment that we need. Where is the plan being developed? Who is accountable for it? And crucially, who is responsible for it? Now, I share Andy Burnham's concerns about the future plans for central Manchester and how we reconcile those with Trans-Pennine route upgrade, HS2, and in future, Northern Powerhouse Rail. We face exactly the same challenges around Leeds and Sheffield, and we know colleagues here in the Northeast have similar concerns about capacity and future service plans for the East Coast mainline. Currently, an opaque set of programme boards meet behind closed doors to agree investment decisions on piecemeal basis. And worse still, you get the sense that across different parts of the fragmented industry, as well as within DFT itself, there are several different versions of the truth about what service patterns are being planned for five or ten years' time from now. Simply put, there does not seem to be a strategy for railway services and the investment to go with them. So it's no wonder it's difficult for people to plan with confidence, whether that's investors looking to develop in city centres or plan new homes or even the railway to plan its own resources. At a North of England level, Transport for the North is trying to join the dots for us. And locally, I'm really grateful for industry colleagues coming together as part of our West Yorkshire Strategic Rail Partnership to try and join things up locally. But there's only so far we can go with these initiatives. We need to fundamentally reform the way the industry works. And that's clear to all of us. I want to be able to do business with the railway. One railway with one plan, with a clear remit to work with us to deliver our local ambitions. A railway I can work with to deliver my economic ambitions for West Yorkshire. So it was great to hear the Secretary of State endorse the case for Great British Railways last month. My plea is to make this happen as soon as possible. And I'm really looking forward to working with Elaine and colleagues from the transition team to make sure Great British Railways works for all of us to, to fill the current strategic void. But let's not forget the importance of dependable services today. Stop start funding settlements for local bus services. The annual business planning process on the railway drives uncertainty. And it's depressing to hear that the day-to-day -day railway is still being managed on a cost basis. That can only be a one-way ticket to manage to decline. So it, it, I was heartened to hear that the Secretary of State and Rail Minister both agree this has to end because the case for reform in the day-to-day -day railway is absolutely deafening. But I'm an optimist. And I do think once we get over the current crisis, we can finally start to work together through strong local partnerships with Great British Railways to deliver the sort of rail services and rail network we need to get the best for our communities across the north. Thank you for your invitation today and I look forward to getting your questions later. Thank you. Morning everybody, uh, my name's Fiona Haightley and I'm Customer Service Director for Unipart Rail. Um, I th think really in terms of my opening remarks, one of the things I'd like to start with really is to say I grew up 
in the northeast. Uh, my parents still live about 30 minutes away from here on the other side of the river in Gateshead. And I studied here. I studied at the University of Sunderland and I still live and work in the north, but now in Doncaster, where we're headquartered in Doncaster, but we also have uh, manufacturing and technology sites in Leeds, Sheffield, and also in the Northwest. So I'm firmly rooted in the North, and I think it's an absolutely fantastic place to live and work and thrive. For me, I think it's really incredibly important that we retain as much of the skills and talent that we get from our great universities here and, you know, our great communities actually in the North. Too often we see people who choose to come and study at our great universities in Newcastle, Durham, Leeds, Sheffield, and then decide that an actual to progress their careers, they're going to move to the south. That's a crying shame and something that we need to really address. For business, it's really important that we have that talent and that we can retain that talent in our region. And creating a, a better transport network so that people can move around the region more freely is really key to that, in my opinion. It's really important that we have that connectivity between our main cities. I think we've talked a little bit this morning about how difficult that journey is from east to west. The, tra the travel time between Leeds and Manchester is about the same roughly as some London commutes, but actually that, tra that passage from north to west, if you're going by road, is torturous. And if you're going by rail can be really difficult too, if you know, with uh, poor service on the trains, etc. So really important that we really invest in that in those routes to to drive that uh, economic growth within our major cities. As a business, we, re we really welcome the uh, investment in TransPan and route upgrade, but there is more that's needed. And actually, things like the Northern Powerhouse Rail, it's really key that those things are delivered and they're delivered well. Businesses are historically attracted to locations which benefit from good access on road and rail. And it's important that we really invest in those areas so that we can keep that um, attractive business investment to our area and also retain our talent. We need to encourage greener ways of transport. We absolutely love our cars, but we need to encourage more people to come out of the cars and come onto the rail and onto buses. But if we don't have good effective ways of uh, alternatives to offer, then people won't do that. And equally, it's not fair on some of those lower income families, for example, to expect people to invest in electric vehicles, which are very expensive. So we absolutely need to drive. Um, investment in public transport so that communities that have the equal access to opportunity. That's it really. Thank you very much for having me this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Elaine Seagrove. I'm Director of Strategic Planning at Great British Railways Transition Team. Yeah, we still are alive and clicking, in case you were wondering. Very busy, keeping us very occupied, um, rising to the challenge of trying to um, implement reform of the railway. No mean feat, as you can imagine. But a big thank you to Transport for the North for inviting me along today. And I just wanted to give you a very brief update on where we're at regarding reform of the railways and what that means for the north of England, if I may. Um, but just also to say that the work that TFN has been doing for a number of years now has been really fantastic in providing that strategic framework. And it's so impressive, the, the way that they've approached the work, bring data and information together to help us as a, you know, as a profession better plan for the future. Um, but rail travel, and we know that rail travel in the North has been experiencing um, pre-pandemic fantastic growth leading up to the pandemic, but boy, oh boy, have there been problems ever, ever since. Um, service and infrastructure planning haven't kept pace with that growth to get you to that point. They take too long to deliver, they cost too much and don't always deliver the benefits that were agreed at the outset. And we know that performance has been particularly problematic of late on some services. Cancellations are particularly troubling, affecting passengers, business, and overall the regional economy and the amount of um, social and economic activity that can be taken forward. 
a consequence of the this is a consequence of the industry, the railway industry being far too complicated, fragmented, and too costly. The industry can seem to be impenetrable to communities as it stands at the moment and the regions it serves. So this transition team that I'm part of is really the mission is to um, reform the industry to make it more accountable so that GBR will be the single accountability, will have the single accountability for track and train going forward, be more collaborative, open and making the railway simpler and better for everyone to use. So Tracy mentioned that um, the Secretary of State reconfirmed the government's commitment, which we were obviously very, very, very happy to receive to support the next phase of, of rail reform and the creation of Great British Railways. Alongside a number of specific commitments around various activities, such that my colleagues are leading on, um, have been keeping us very busy around ticketing reform, um, legislation development, things like that. Um, but really focusing the reform on the needs of customers going forward and developing the or setting up the new body. The railway as a whole needs to refocus around its customers, both passengers and freight customers, um, to make it simpler at every stage. The fares ticketing and retailing reform is a key part of this. Um, Fares at the moment are much too complicated and difficult for people to understand and to have the trust that they're getting the best fare available. So there's a, a, an important work stream leading, leading that at the moment, investing in the expansion as pay, of pay as you go, including 700 stations in the north, in the north of England by 2025. The extension of single leg pricing you may have heard about trialling on LNER, demand-based pricing, also trialling on some LNER routes later this year. And for our very our other very important customer base, a strategic freight unit will provide, provide a single and accountable guiding mind to help rail freight do much, much more with a specific freight growth target set later this year. Fragmented thinking has long prevented the industry from modernising to meet the changing needs of our customers different parts of the industry with different incentives, all acting rationally, independently, but without a common set of objectives. This is why the Secretary of State committed to the publication of a long-term strategy for real. And that's what that I'm responsible for de developing that, and that will be available later this year. The strategy will provide the industry, the supply chain stakeholders with a clear, clear view on the long-term direction for the real industry based on a common and agreed set of objectives, including improved customer experience, financial sustainability, environmental sustainability, long-term economic growth, improved connectivity for communities to support levelling up. One of the reasons I'm here today, because we want to be part of that con wider conversation. This will provide the Department and GBR Minister, Secretary of State, with a framework for decision making going forward, such that we can get better joined up decisions, giving clarity on priorities and key decisions that need to be made across the rail industry. It will help us to think through the trade-offs and make those tough choices. This, of course, includes funding choices for infrastructure, but that's not all. We are linking up the infrastructure with track operations and it's my job and the job of the team to look at the bigger picture, not just the infrastructure itself, and how we help unlock wider benefits working with partners to achieve full economic, social, environmental potential of rail across the country. Part of that is the role of the railways in placemaking. So it's not just about the infrastructure, it's also about the places we serve and the stations as the centre of new and existing communities. By thinking beyond the gate line, and embracing the environment our stations are in, we have the opportunity to support the creation of centres of activity that will attract people to places and support economic growth and pride in place. So it's not just about the stations in themselves, it's the nodes of transport and how they work with the wider transport network and the places they serve. There's a huge opportunity there to make, them, make much more of that. Making more inclusive, more accessible, healthy environments, and as areas become more vibrant, easier to get around, spend time safe 
and safer. Anyone visiting my home city of Glasgow cannot help but but to be impressed by the newly developed Queen Street station as a gateway to the iconic George's Square and city centre. What a difference, genuinely what a difference. I was there last week. It makes to that place where people love to spend time, weather permitting, of course. Um, <laughs> similar improvements are being progressed around the country, but ne more needs to be done to embed that practice, that placemaking ideology into the planning processes but also integrate with other transport modes. There's a huge opportunity there. Rail has a huge, a huge role to play in decarbonising the wider transport network and potentially ha helping to address and provide a solution for congestion. With the UK population expecting to grow by several million and an ageing population, we need to make sure that we make the most of the existing system that we have. And also with a shortage of affordable housing, it's critical to get the land use and transport planning working in parallel. I'm sure many of you would agree that that's not happening. Only with exception is that happening really at the moment. If we do it, we'll create well-located well homes and communities and reduce car dependency for future generations. But we can only do that working together with you, with our partners. In his review of the railway, Keith Williams was very clear that decision-making in the railway needs to be closer to the communities it serves. But more than that, there is a clear need for the railway to be even more accountable to the cities and regions across the country, which is why Great British Railways will have strong regional business divisions working in partnerships with regional government. Whilst we'll have a national strategy, we'll then go on to have regional strategies working with our partners. Strategically aligned with local ambitions and not just integrated transport plans, but with housing, economic and environmental strategies. We are working with regions across the country to develop those reg regional partnership deals to agree how we can deliver on this promise going forward. Starting but not ending with devolution deals and legacy agreements already in place, including Greater Manchester and Real North Partnership going forward, but many more. The North does need investment, this is clear, but we know we won't get the full value of such investment with, with, without reform of the railways and a body capable of whole system thinking, working with both national and regional government to join up decision making. We are working to make that happen and your support is really invaluable in helping us to get there together. Thank you and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Good morning, everyone. I am Professor Karishma Chowdhury. I am a chair in behavior modeling at Institute for Transport Studies, University of Leeds. So Katie was talking about diversity. So I think um, I kind of uh, bring uh, the, a totally different personal experience on the table because I'm not local originally. So I was born and brought up in Bangladesh. And in terms of transport, like I did not need a car when I grew up because I could either use cycle to go to my school or other places or can use rickshaws, which are also not um, kind of um, fossil fuel driven. Then I uh, made a long journey. I went to MIT in Boston and I was there for seven years doing my master's, PhD and postdoc. And still uh, that's a city where I could live without a car because the public transport was really, really very good. Then I moved to London and Cambridge. I spent a couple of years working there. And there also, uh, it was possible really easy, uh, really, to live without a car. Then I moved to Leeds in 2012. And then, uh, though I tried living without a car, eventually, like, we had to get a car, just especially when we had our kid, it was really difficult to especially take him to like after school activities like swimming classes and this type of things without a car because uh, those who are familiar with Leeds, Leeds has a good public transport system if you are going trying to go to the city center but when you are trying from to go from east to west or uh, from one neighborhood uh, to another neighborhood which is not passing to the city center it's really really difficult but still we managed to survive as a one car household because for commuting, we were still using public transport. 
And now last year, we moved to Addingham, that is a village in uh, North York, uh, actually it falls under Bradford City Council. Um, and then I realized that actually maybe we have to move to a two-car household because uh, it's, even though we moved there thinking about the transport connectivity that we can get a train from Ilkley or Skipton, the connections to the stations is not something that's, uh, that has reliability. So there is bus service, but the bus can be uh, 10 minutes late or 15 minutes late, and that will totally mess up our plan to take a train to go somewhere. So now coming to the point we're discussing, like why do we need better investment in transport in the north? Because there are people like me who want to have a more sustainable uh, travel pattern and want to uh, live without car, but the current uh, infrastructure or the current network is not allowing me to do that. Now, there are, there's also a second group of pe pe people I have come across who actually are more severely impacted by not having this connectivity. So for example, I came across a person who was born and brought up in the UK, but from an ethnic, so she's from a Bangladeshi origin, so she does not speak English very well. And she was looking for a job and she could only work as a cleaner basically, but her kind of radius where she could find a job was extremely limited because she was living in South of Leeds and anywhere she wanted to go, like if she wanted to get a job in a more uh, like maybe affluent part of the city, she actually had to make like a one and a half hour journey. And uh, she was, she needed a day, day ticket, which was four and a half pounds, where maybe her hourly wage rate is the minimum wage rate. So at some point, like she was telling me that maybe she's better off living on benefits rather than trying to work because of, she has to spend so much time just traveling in order to get to her, uh, uh, like get to a place where which offers her a job. So I think that's another reason, like this group of people, we need more investment uh, in the North so that uh, the same kind of level of service that people of this social demographic characteristics in London get, like ideally we should be um, also able to offer the same job opportunities and same sort of uh, kind of educational opportunities and everything to uh, regardless of the income or social background. Then uh, there's also a third group, like maybe they can um, afford a car, but maybe um, they have this intention that maybe to use public transport. But another barrier for them is uh, maybe the information is not there. So uh, Elaine, I think was mentioning about this uh, splitting the fair uh, website. But if we look at the kind of wider population, there's uh, this new, newer kind of website or newer kinds of apps and um, all these things that can provide information about seamless travel options from one part to the other. That's also lacking. And if you, those of you who have lived both in London versus North, you can see a marked difference in the kind of uh, providers or, or like provision of this sort of service. In London, like if you try to uh, search how we can go from one point to another point, we can get like a really good multimodal journey recommendation. Whereas in the North, it's at least in Leeds, it's not there yet. And it's not something that can happen automatically. It's equally important to invest in infrastructure, but also uh, kind of invest to ensure that uh, people get that information and uh, there is good in integration about the different facilities. There's really a good kind of whole system um, approach rather than just providing a building, a, like improving a rail line or ra rail station. Like there needs to be more investment in getting the benefits uh, to the people who can um, ensure that the potential of these investments are maximized. And then, uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a, a chair in behavior modeling. So I work a lot with like behavioral change and uh, how people make the decisions. And as you're uh, all aware, like in a lot of, there's a lot of research showing that nudging can help a lot in changing behavior. And so, so the fourth group of people uh, I would like to mention is maybe they are um, not thinking about a sustainable lifestyle or sustainable uh, transport uh, pattern, but uh, we need, uh, there's a huge potential to actually 
nudge these people to have a greener lifestyle, and that is crucial for us to achieve the net zero target. And that also is not going to like happen uh, like overnight without any investment. So in order to ensure this sort of behavioral change and making uh, people think about alternative ways of uh, travel, it's really important to make these transport investments. Another aspect of this is um, just, uh, we should not look at transport as a single element. Like it's a very integrated part of our lifestyle. So this nudging thing, like if, if they're taking, for example, like they're taking like they're cycling or they're taking more public transport, that is going to trickle down to their other behavior as well. And that can help them think about like, okay, how they can they, lead a more sustainable, like more greener lifestyle in general. So there's a kind of indirect benefit that uh, is kind of an untapped potential uh, to some extent uh, that we are missing in terms of uh, without this uh, better transport in investments in the North. The Another point I would like to bring uh, uh, in my researcher's hat on is the travel behavior or the transport models, these are very regional and very like location specific. Like there has been a lot of research on the transferability of the transport policies or transport models among one part to the other. And most of them say that like, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the behavior, in the network, in the kind of um, local preferences and settings. So, the, in order to achieve the maximum potential even of the current infrastructure or when we are planning for new infrastructure in transport, actually uh, we need to think about uh, do, are the current models or the current data that are being uh, used for driving these investment decisions, are they actually adequate? Because uh, just have the, there is a big difference in um, the lifestyle, but also in terms of the landscape, the density, and all these things in North and South. So from, from the kind of um, researcher perspective as well, uh, there's a big need to invest more um, resources so that we can have models which are better suited for um, making the uh, kind of travel behavior predictions when the investments are made in the north, so that like uh, they're, it's it's not just uh, fine just to wait, uh, apply the models that are developed for the whole country or for the south, and try to get the same outcomes or same results when they're applied in the north. And another thing I would like to highlight. So it was also mentioned like actually. One of the benefits of the North is we have a lot of universities and we have a lot of international students. And actually that also offers us actually to be the kind of pioneer or being a leader globally as well, like in terms of transport innovations, like rather than trying to replicate what has been done in um, the Southern cities, actually uh, we can try to see or come up with novel solutions like, uh, with a vision, like for example, like uh, how can we make Leeds car free? Like how, how can we make uh, like Manchester city where people can live without owning a car? So all these big cities where there are kind of uh, students and people coming from all over the world, like if we can actually um, demonstrate to them about these uh, newer kind of uh, radical uh, transport interventions, they can actually uh, serve as ambassadors to uh, improve the global reputation of North of England as well, or uh, the in general uh, UK. So I think that's why also we need more investments in the North because uh, we have this untapped uh, potential that we can be global leaders in transport. We have one of the biggest uh, transport departments in the world actually. So Institute for Transport Studies, in terms of the student size and the staff size, it's uh, the third largest in the world actually. But- uh, Should we, yes. we end it on yes, that yes. note? Because I'm thinking we might need to do a few questions. Yes, <laughs> thanks. So yes, so basically like, uh, I think we need more investments because we can be actually the pioneers in this field. Thanks. Thank you.
So you've had a chance there to hear some perspectives, um, very varying perspectives, um, lots of diverse views in there, the thought around whole systems thinking about how we can use transport to, to change communities, to change the way we work. Um, so who's got some questions for our panel? Um, I think we've got rolling mics somewhere, I'm hoping. Have we? Yep. Excellent. Can we take the first question over here? Gentleman in the blue top, please. Uh, thanks for all the contributions. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm Nick Arnold. I'm retired. I, I'm, I'm described as a proto-mammal and middle-aged man in Lycra. But uh, I was going to ask a question about cycling, but... Um, what I'd like to ask in terms of investment, um, and I think Jamie Driscoll mentioned it a couple of times this morning, uh, the concept of a land value tax. Um, is that something that is pragmatic and would it require national legislation to uh, be able to apply to investment in transport? Yeah, thank you. Please call me Tracy. Um, uh, I, I absolutely agree with you that it's something that we've been discussing. I know Transport for the North have been looking into it, how we can make that case. But certainly what we were hearing just now about placemaking, that investment in railways is about also placemaking. So it's those, it's those stations that then open up housing, that open up communities, that open up opportunities for active travel planning. And certainly as the mayor of West Yorkshire, I'm spend, spending many millions on active travel and getting people onto bikes. But also part of the problem is our topography. I mean, you may be, you may be a really great cyclist, I'm not. I would need an electric bike to get around West Yorkshire. And that's why we're investing in, we're starting at Leeds City Station. We've got electric um, bikes. They, the team are going to call them braving bikes, but I did worry about that, <laughs> being a woman. Um, uh, but I, I, think, I think that's the way forward that we can invest in electric bikes, but also to make the case for trains that can also take cyclists. Because often it's, uh, if you haven't booked, you can't get on. Oh, you can't hear me. Um, if you if you haven't booked, you can't get on. And making making it easier for people to have that multimodal experience, where you can get your bike, take it to the bus stop, or take it to the train station, and so on. We need more people cycling. No doubt about it. This is quite odd. Anyway, I think we may may have some microphone issues. I think if I could just add to that as well, that Martin Tugwell mentioned this morning about the size of the potential economic prize in terms of gross value added. And I think it's recognising that that is only achievable through a variety of policy levers. And I think that idea, we've got to, we've got to be creative here. It's, it's not just invest in transport and that's what will happen. It's all the other things. It's the housing, it's the energy, it's the digital, it's skills. Um, so a really, really good question. Um, gentlemen behind you. If we can just pass the microphone. Um, we've, we've had a lot of discussion about the rail investment and the poor east-west uh, connections. Uh, our road, our, our road network system that we've not discussed that, other than the lo the locality. Our east-west connections between our industrial centres of uh, the northeast, you know, South Yorkshire and uh, Lancashire and Greater Manchester, Merseyside. It's appalling, you know. We, we've got the M62 and no, nothing else to move, to move freight. We'll never solve it by uh, uh, a massive investment in railway. We will make, we'll always need freight, a lot of freight to move on the road and and also. So, we, we do you not think we need to screen for better in, uh, road infrastructure connection between between Newcastle, Carlisle? Uh, Lancashire A fifty nine M sixty five to to York, to Leeds and uh, North Bradford York Sheffield Manchester is ridiculous but on the rail you know two of the biggest uh, centres in the UK for manufacturing you cannot get from you know part of Greater Manchester to South Yorkshire with it take you two hours with a, a lorry and that is pathetic for something that thirty five miles apart. Chrisma, perhaps you'd like to give us a view on this one? Maybe want to give you any specific examples or why I mean, it's not happening. Go to Fiona and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so I'm really well placed to answer this question because I work for Unipart Rail. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, I think in in short, my answer would be yes. I I, I feel I, I feel that there's a, probably a case for for both. You know, I think it's it's not enough to put all of the investment in one area. Um, I would obviously advocate for strong investment in rail for for obvious reasons but as a resident in south yorkshire and also from a, you know having originally come from the northeast i i agree you know those those routes north and south and east to west are are difficult and torturous and i think there there is a strong argument to say that actually what we need in the north is is more investment in all modes of transport not just rail not just bus but actually on the road as well so i wouldn't disagree with you um but like i say i, I would make a strong case for rail. <laughs> I think think there's an important point here that, you know, if we're looking at more mass transit, if we're looking at active travel, it's about how we use the roads and how we keep them safe as well. Um, because we're not, we, I think we all recognise that we need, we need multimodal approach here, but we also need better connectivity between those modes as well um, to help us decarbonise. I, I was just wanted, um, Chris, did you want to add anything more to that? Yes, I totally agree with uh, what Katie was mentioning that actually, um, there is also, in addition to the just uh, linking them better, there's a big role that the like better coordination, better integration, and better connectivity can uh, play. Uh, like rather than just looking at active travel and uh, road and rail in isolation, uh, we can actually uh, we should be thinking about like how can we better integrate all of these so that uh, within the, we can optimize the investments basically. Thank you. I think the lady in the front had a question here. If we pass the microphone around. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Um, I'm Rosalind Coldley. I work for Sustrans, which is the charity that is helping more people walk and cycle for everyday journeys, so short journeys, so the beginning and end of those, those public transport journeys. So we're strong advocates for um, supporting uh, public transport as well of course um, and when people ask me where my office is I say it's on a train um, so my question though is really we we are having more investment in active travel which is fantastic but we're struggling to get enough people who want to come and work in this sector and um, so I'm starting to get interested in skills development so I was wondering is that the same across the transport um, sort of network or transport organizations that we're struggling to find people who we want to attract into this uh, into our workforce and how are each of you tackling that? I was going to say perhaps I can come to Elaine first. That's a fantastic question. I thought you were going to ask me about access to the railway. We're doing some, you've just completed a, an excellent piece in Scotland looking at access to all the railway stations and we're hoping to have a look at that to roll that out for some case studies in England. So any volunteers to talk to us about that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, so um, your colleague John Lauder in, in Scotland who's been doing am amazing work. Anyway, on skills is what's the question. Absolutely. I mean, part of the long-term strategy is looking at the long-term workforce planning. And that's more of a sort of think about the, the practicality of attracting people to, to work in the operations of the railway as part of that, because there's a huge challenge um, that most, the vast majority of people who work in, in the railway are sort of getting a bit older and sort of waiting for kind of retirement. There's a huge challenge then to bridge that gap going forward. So that's the practicality. And then the the sort of more practical day-to-day, -day, um, you know, thinking about, you know, attracting younger people into the industry. I mean, it's a fantastic industry if you describe um, what it can deliver and how it can change communities and, you know, the relevance of it, you know, what it means for people's day-to-day -day lives. If you if you describe it as, you know, the nuts and bolts of, you know, um, building track and all of that, then you're only going to attract, you know, a narrower selection of, of the population. So my view is, and certainly my experience working for many years, Transport for London, by making it very relevant to people's lives, then suddenly you you do attract a wider cross-section of, of the population. So that's what we are, we are trying to do to make it a much more accessible industry. So we are focusing on that, but diversity and culture change is, is critical to do that. And that, that takes a little bit of time. So it wasn't a very so Come to Tracy and then Fiona as well. Th thank you. Um, it's such a brilliant question because 
we are not going to get the network that we want and that we deserve without the workforce. And that's where devolution is really powerful. And that's the case that I'm making to government continually. Give us deeper, wider devolution so that we can identify where the skills gaps are and we can then step in. And I know that Elaine and I are going to be working closely together, identifying what do we need for a workforce. So, for example, mass transit, um, an extraordinary scheme. Um, it's, it, Leeds is one of the only cities in Europe without a mass transit. It's going to be decades long, this work. We are in a position where we can set up the courses now. And in three years time, we will have a workforce that's part of the pipeline. But I need to be able to work with government to say, release, you know, release the grip a little bit on skills. Adult education budget has been devolved, which is good, but there's lots of people that are a long way away from even getting in a classroom where we can help and 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 open it up, as, as was said, you know, we have a panel of women here, open it up to women in this sector. It's becoming more digitized. It's becoming, um, uh, you, you know, an opportunity for people, not necessarily just to get out and about on the networks and on the tracks, but to, to have fantastic careers go to the very top um, in GB Rail and in and companies that are delivering across the UK and globally. You can have a global career in this sector. So it's something I'm a champion of and it'd be interesting to see how the trailblazer um, devolution uh, pots roll out with Andy Burnham and uh, Andy Street in, in uh, West Mids because we need that power and um, uh, devolved uh, focus on skills because then we can intervene when necessary and each region has its own local challenge I know what we need for West Yorkshire and um, I can help government deliver at a faster pace so it, it's, a, it's a plea I keep making that we we are here to help Thank you, Justel. I invite Fiona to say a, a few words there but I think this theme of you know local places local communities know what works best um, Fiona I think it's, it is a really good question and, and it is something that, you know, um, as, a, as a company in the private sector working in the railway supply chain, we really struggle with, um, you know, understanding, you know, uh, how you attract people into the industry. And I think historically the industry has been seen as very traditionally engineering based, but, you know, within our business, there's opportunities to uh, have a career in, you know, a commercial environment uh, like myself in engineering, in working on track, in manufacturing, um, you know, in technology and more and more now in sort of digital technologies like software engineering and that with the digital railway. So there are a broad base of, you know, really interesting and, you know, exciting opportunities within rail. And I think it's, it is a challenge as to how we attract talent into the industry. One of the things that we do is we run an apprenticeship scheme. We do STEM events in local schools, et cetera. But I think that we need, as an industry, we need to absolutely do more of that um, to make sure that we are attracting the best talent from, a, from across the piece and keeping it in the north as well. And to have role models as well. Absolutely. So people can see themselves in those jobs as well yeah. in the future. But really good question. Thank you. We've got time for, for one one more, I think. Oh, I've got several hands go. I'm going to go with the first hand that went up, which was the gentleman there, I think, with a slightly red maroon top on. Um, is that you? Can we get can we get the microphone to the gentleman, please? Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great you're talking about the mass, the light rail system for Leeds Bradford, but what about a heavy rail link between the interchange and Bradford Forster Square? It's been talked about for years, but it's never been taken forward. And that that would unlock you know, great public transport links. Yeah, Bradford is the the I think the greatest opportunity for West Yorkshire and across the north. I think what what we could deliver there is second to none. As I said, it's the youngest, the most diverse community, and the least connected. Um, we want to make sure that youngsters from Bradford can get to Leeds and can get across the north, can take up these brilliant jobs. Um, I think. Uh, working with government, trying to get them to finally, after I think it's 15 to 18 months we've been waiting for the um, the terms of reference on how we get fast trains from Sheffield to Leeds and then the electrification from Leeds to Bradford. It is not for want of trying. We are waiting for government. And once we get some clarity around that, uh, we will definitely get to work. I think Bradford 2025, as I mentioned, you know, the city of culture is going to be a game changer. We need to be able to get 
people to Bradford yeah. to experience all that the city of culture has got to offer. So I know that government do understand that. I know that they are aware that of the sense of urgency, but you're absolutely right. And the, the um, St. James's plan for a new station is also exciting. There's um, a real sense of um, um, uh, excitement around Bradford with all the regeneration around the market square, around the uh, city square as well with uh, the 4,000 seater new music venue, grade A um, office space. Really, Bradford's starting to punch above its way and it's a really exciting time to be in Bradford. But we want to make sure that people can get there and working with government putting pressure on government saying we can't take our foot off the gas here we've got to deliver for the people of Bradford and the people for the north yeah that's fine but will you, will you be pushing for hope it because it would be a more long-term aim a heavy railing between Bradford interchange and Bradford falls to square well, I think all things are on the table because it's down to government as well. We need to bring partners with us. Um, there is the new station in St. James's, as I mentioned as well. So I think there are things that are pretty fluid at the moment, but very happy to talk to you um, once the session's finished. Thank you for the question. So we've got just a few more minutes before lunch. I, I never like to part people from their lunch for too long, but if there was one more question, I think there was one of the gentlemen there in the... Can we pass the microphone across to him, please? Is there. Thank you very much. I think it's switched on. You should just be able to speak into it. Can I uh, pose a question to Elaine, please? Um, I'm obviously encouraged by your comments as to the direction of flow with GBR. But do you believe, and particularly bearing in mind the roller coaster which you seem to apply between the DFT and GBR over the last 12 months, that the civil servants in the DFT will really back off? trying to micromanage the railway with the depopulation department that that will, uh, I assume, uh, flow. Civil servants aren't known for giving up jobs easily. Elaine. Speaking from experience. <laughs> Bitter experience. Um, well, you know what? There's a big transformation programme going on within the department and working with GBR to decide on um, what happens where going forward, but certainly it's it's shifting a lot of the key decisions into GBR because that's where the you need to have this clear accountability, which people are very frustrated by at the moment. So there is going to be a a change in ways of working. Still, obviously, going to have civil servants involvement to justify, you know, to work to work with. I mean, I'm working very closely with them, with um, you know, some great support of. Um, teams within the department at the moment but I'm hoping that with the clarification of this review that we're really really able to be really clear to our customers and the wider population you know who who holds the accountability who they can speak to at the moment it's not clear do you speak to the train operators do you speak to network rail do you speak to the department you know, but this will put the responsibility fairly and squarely with with GBR. Um, it won't happen overnight. It's going, it's going to take going to take time. But there's, you know, as is ratified by the secretary a few weeks back, sort of a clear. There's a, such a clear need to sort this out. Mm. You know, it's just, you know, it's unbelievably complicated Thank trying you. to get things done. Thank you. So. Elaine, thank you. Well, I'm going to attempt to just close the session now. Um, I think we've heard, I'm thinking what words describe the last 45 minutes or so? Collaboration. What else have we got? Positive. Positive. It's exciting. Exciting. Yes, I, I would say, again, like, I think we should be try to be the pioneer in the UK. Pioneering. Pioneering. Yes. Good. Yeah, right. change, catalyst, positivity, all good, all good, all good place to be for before we break for lunch. Thank you for your questions this morning. Thank you for listening. Um, I know our, I'm sure our panel are going to be around over the lunch break. Yes. So, so if you've got other, anything else that you want to ask, um, please feel free to find us. Um, as I said, lunch is if you go out the back doors, it's in the the the, st the suite where we immediately were, and in the restaurant in the bar, and we're kicking off again at half past one. Thank you. Thank you.